In this video, we will be discussing momentum and impulse. Momentum can be thought of as inertia and motion. The equation for momentum is mass times velocity. Uh, the symbol that you'll often see is P is equal to mv. The units for mass is kilograms. The units for velocity is meters per second. Um, and so the unit for momentum is just a combination of those two units, which is kilograms, meters per second. Let's take a look at two objects that are both moving with different mass. One has a mass of three kilogram, one has a mass of four kilogram, and we're going to compare their momentum. The object on the left is moving to the right with a velocity of four meters per second. The object on the right is moving to the right with a velocity of three meters per second. Um, how do their momentum compare? So momentum is mass times velocity, so the one on the left is 3 times 4, which is 12 kilograms meters per second. And then the one on the right has a momentum of 4 times 3, which gives us also 12 kilograms meters per second. So both of these objects have the same momentum. Even though they have different mass and they have different speed, they have the same momentum because momentum depends on not only the mass but also the speed. Also, momentum is a vector, so I'm going to go ahead and put an arrow here just to remind you that momentum can be positive or negative. Let's take a look at these two objects again, but this time the velocity on the one on the left is moving to the left with a velocity of 4 meters per second and the object to the right is still going to the right with a velocity of 3 meters per second. Um, how do their momentums compare? We know it's going to be 12 kilograms meters per second um, but how do we account for the direction? Because momentum is a vector, momentum is a vector, velocity is a vector, um, we can indicate the direction by either saying right or left, east or west, or we can also indicate it by the positive or negative direction. So the one on the left, momentum is mass times velocity. So this would be 3 times a negative 4 because it's going to the left. And so it's going to have a momentum of negative 12 kilogram meters per second. And then the one on the right will have a momentum of 4 times three will be positive three because it's in the positive direction and that object's momentum will be 12 kilogram meters per second. So notice the negative, all the negative is telling us is just telling us the direction that the object is moving. Now let's look at the concept of impulse. Here we have a ball that's hitting the wall. Initially the force is fairly small and then as it gets uh, compressed, it gets larger and then larger. You can see that's very deformed here. Uh, that here the wall is pushing on the ball a lot of force, and then as it bounces back, the force decreases, decreases. Uh, so the more deformed the ball is, the more force that the wall is pushing on this ball, and so the uh, force is increasing and then it decreases um, as you can see through the deformation of the ball. So on the force first time graph, you might have something like this. So it's going to increase and then it's going to uh, decrease. And this is a force first time graph. Now uh, the area in this force first time graph, the, f the area under the curve, uh, we have a name for this quantity which we call impulse. Impulse. Okay. So impulse is the area. One way to find impulse is to say that it's the um, area under the force versus time graph. So that's one way to figure out the impulse. Okay. The other way to find impulse is to uh, calculate it and we can also calculate impulse 
um, and it is equal to uh, the force times the time. The force times the time. On this graph, you'll see that the force changes. Um, if the force is changing, we can use the average force. Uh, so uh, if it's a constant force, then just use that force. But if it's changing, we can use the average force. Uh, so in this graph right here, what I would do to find the uh, impulse would be area under the curve. Or if I knew what the average force was um, times the time, uh, that would also allow me to calculate the impulse. So let's say if the average was here, OK, and then um, we we would calculate that area right there. Um, that would also give us the impulse. For constant uh, force, um, the equation would just be impulse equals force uh, times time. And the units here uh, for force is newtons. The unit for uh, time is seconds. And the unit for impulse is newton seconds. Now let's look, look at a problem where we can use the graphical method to find the impulse. So to find the impulse, remember that the impulse is equal to the area under the force versus time graph. And in this case, that area um, is inside a triangle. So we can go ahead and just use our 1 half base times height. And if we do that, we get 1 half 0.5 times 10 and we get 2.5 newton seconds. So if it's triangle, we could just use the area of a triangle equation. If it's rectangle, we can use the rect area of a rectangle equation. Next, I'd like to look at how impulse is related to momentum. I'm going to start with Newton's second law, which tells us that the force, the net force, is equal to ma. And we also know that acceleration uh, by definition is the change in velocity over the change in time. If I substitute that for the acceleration, I get F equals M delta V over delta T. If I move the delta T to the left hand side, I get F delta T equals M delta V. And on the left hand side, this side right here, I have impulse. This is impulse right here on the left-hand side. And the right-hand side over here, uh, we refer to this as change in momentum. Change in momentum. This is also referred to as the impulse momentum theorem. On the right-hand side, we can um, rewrite this as m, since delta v is final minus initial. We can also write this as mv final minus mv initial. And we have a symbol uh, for mv. We know what mv is, right? mv is right momentum. mv is momentum. So the final momentum minus the initial momentum is equal to the impulse. In other words, if you exert an impulse on an object, you will cause that object's momentum to change. The impulse momentum theorem is helpful for helping us to understand how airbags work. So on the left hand side is a situation where there is a airbag. On the right hand side is a situation where there is no airbag. In both situations, the vehicle is traveling at the same speed and they're both coming to a stop. So the change in momentum on the left hand side, the m delta v on the left hand side, is equal to the m delta v on the right hand side. They both have the same change in momentum. The difference is that on the left hand side, it's occurring over a longer period of time. So that delta t is going to be much bigger. And so it's going to have a smaller force. While on the right hand side with no airbag, this collision between the head and the steering wheel is going to be a shorter time and it's going to have a larger force. So to minimize the impact force, the collision force, we want to increase the amount of time, which is what the airbag um, does and helps the person to not be injured as much. 
The impulse momentum theorem is also helpful for us to understand why coaches might ask players to follow through when they're hitting a ball in baseball, softball, or maybe in tennis. Uh, because when you follow through, what you're doing is you're increasing, you're increasing the time. And as you increase the time, you're going to increase the momentum, which means that the ball is going to go faster and go farther. In the next video, we'll look at some mathematical problems that apply the concept of the impulse momentum theorem.